Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Ghadoop Meetup. I'm Gaurav Salia. I'll be the coordinator for today's event. I manage the big data observability charter at LinkedIn. And uh, fortunately, I have a self-sufficient team, so I can spend more time watching cat videos on YouTube than managing the team. It works well for me. And uh, I know some of you might be thinking this is not funny. I get that from my daughters almost every day. It's a numbers game, though. Right? So you dole the rice more, and you hit more chances of success. Right? Uh, so jokes aside, um, a very warm welcome to everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time to come here. This is a hybrid event. Due to limited seating capacity, we could only have a few people here. But we are very excited to have uh, all of you at LinkedIn and also for LinkedIn to organize the Big Data Meetup. We have four interesting talks today about different technologies in big data. And we hope that uh, the learnings from these talks and the insights that you gain will be useful for either solving some of the problems that you run into or even architecting the solutions for the products that you work at your companies. And we do have a couple of minutes. We'll start at 3.10. So just to get things started, we have a couple of trivia questions. And um, let's see you know, if uh, we can get um, answers close enough. Um, I'll begin with uh, any guesses in terms of uh, what's the number of line of code that we have in Hadoop. I can tell you it's in millions. Anybody wants to take a guess in terms of what it would be? Uh, much higher than that. The answer was 5 million, but it's much higher than that. Any other guesses? Lower. <laughs> higher? <laughs> it's, I think somebody said 25. It's uh, close enough. It's uh, 34 million. And um, if you think about it, uh, for an open source project to have uh, 34 million lines of code, it's uh, fairly significant. Which brings me to the second question in terms of uh, what do you think are the number of contributors to Hadoop? It said it was open sourced in 2009. Since then, ballpark, any guess? Varun, do we have any answers on the chat as well? If there are, please let me know. Sorry, there was some answer here. 50,000 is way too high. <laughs> and 300 is a little bit lower. It's in that ballpark, though. Any other guesses? Lower. By a factor of five. So we have about 1,050 contributors. And again, if you think about it, uh, for an open source project to have around 1,000 people who are actually checking in code, coordinating without any manager, a director, somebody giving them direction, without a program manager, any of that, like people just coming together, it shows that when you are passionate about a technology and when you really want to work together as a group, you can do wonders. And Hadoop is a great example of that. Um, can somebody give me a time check? Where are we right now? Eight past three. Okay, perfect. So um, with that, we'll, uh, we want to start at 310 sharp. And so I'll start with the introduction of our first speaker. The first talk is from LinkedIn, which is about data ingestion at LinkedIn. The speaker is uh, Bupendra Kumar Jain. He's a staff engineer at LinkedIn, as well as the tech lead for offline data ingestion and data compliance. He leads the low latency ingestion at data, or sorry, of um, data onto the data lake at LinkedIn and scaling it so that we can ensure there is compliance, which in turn helps us manage the member trust. Prior to LinkedIn, he was the architect of uh, a big data team at a different company where he worked on HDFS, HBase, YARN, and also built a highly scalable KV store. Right. So with that, I'll hand it off to Bupendra, uh, or Bupi as we call him, and he'll talk you. He'll walk you through the talk. We have about 25 minutes for the talk, and the last five minutes reserved for Q and A. I would uh, highly encourage people to save the questions till the end so that we don't interrupt the speaker. Uh, for questions in the room, um, we can take them live. If there are questions on the chat, uh, please type them as and when uh, you think about them, and then we'll read them towards the end. Right. Pupi, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Gaurav. Yeah. 
yeah uh, hello everyone uh, first of all thanks for joining the meetup i am bupendra uh, i am part of the data infrastructure org in linkedin and uh, uh, the data infrastructure org actually uh, in the linkedin provides the uh, all the necessary platforms the services uh, all the necessary toolings to to do everything with the data so when i say data in today's world i think uh, data is everything right data is money and uh, the more data the right data and the right set of data you have you are uh, that's a key to the success of the business right so so data infra team uh, data infra org is enabling uh, our users to uh, get the uh, insights easily from the all the uh, huge uh, data which we have at the linkedin and then uh, so uh, when i say the platform and services it's like the uh, processing the data in the uh, near real time to storing the data in the offline data lake to the streaming ingestion or providing the data store like a search the graph the your document store the kv store or the pub sub so all sort of a, a toolings and services are provided by the data infra and it aims to make users life simple to just you know go and uh, do your uh, what you are supposed to do as in business analytics like uh, get your uh, get the meaningful data meaningful insights out of the data right so that's the uh, overall the data infra org which is uh, currently in the linkedin is aiming to do and then as part of that today's talk we will uh, talk about the offline side of the data ingestion so uh, let, let's start so uh, here is the agenda uh, first uh, let me walk you through the overall linkedin data ecosystem so this will set the context for us to you know understand how the data is flowing in the linkedin uh, we'll take some couple of examples and the use cases and the ingestion scenarios and then uh, we will uh, get into the some of the platforms which we are using today for the offline data ingestion uh then we will talk about some of the uh, data management aspect of it and the the challenges and the future work which we are planning to do in the data ingestion domain yep yeah so i'm uh, not sure if you have seen this picture earlier but then i do love this picture because it it actually depicts the overall linkedin data ecosystem in a very simple and uh, uh, it it depicts the overall picture actually so uh i i hope everyone of us are in the linkedin so we have the linkedin account and in the linkedin world we refer uh, uh, every account as in a linkedin member so we all are the linkedin member and anything we do on the linkedin app or in the linkedin.com so it it's like it will be generating the data so if i go to the linkedin.com uh, and share a post it it's like a, a one sort of a change which i have generated or one new uh, data which i have generated if i go and if i am navigating across different pages or i am uh, if i am doing a click then that's a, another source of a data right so every activity which linkedin member is doing or uh, just uh, you know uh, operating on the linkedin app or something it's generating the data so of course all this uh, data is captured by our online services and some of this uh, uh, this data is ingested into our source of tr truth data store which we call as an online data store so we have the Uh, espresso as our document store and then we have the mysql oracle and some more uh, dbms uh, to capture all the member related uh, data like the profile data settings the comments the post and uh, everything right the other set of data is like the uh, you are uh, doing the search you are doing navigating across different pages and the doing the clicks so these are like the uh, events which are uh, captured and generated by the services and this is like a second source of uh, uh, truth for the uh, data now what happens is uh, all this data is uh, stored in the online data store as well as this data will be uh, streamed into uh, streamed by our streaming ingestion platforms so the use cases which needs to which needs the real near real time processing will actually hook into the streaming ingestion uh, uh, platform and will get the data out of it the same streaming data will be ingested into finally into the data lake which will enable the use cases uh, like the ai ml training your model and various other use cases so uh, and then finally what will happen is when you have your ai ml or your lot of data analytics you will have your jobs which will massage this data curate this data you will get the meaningful data out of it and then again this data is pushed into the uh, online data store which is uh, uh based on the use cases and the needs it will can be a search data store the graph 
the uh, espresso as in serving the site and MySQL and various other things, right? So, so this is the data life cycle uh, wherein uh, the data is flowing by the member activity to again uh, uh, stored in the data lake in the near line system, online system and going back uh, the meaningful data going back to the site. Uh, so this is like a member activity. So LinkedIn do have the uh, other customers like the LinkedIn uh, recruiting platform, the talent solution and all. So again, uh, whatever activity is done on those platforms, that is like another source of uh, uh, data. So the data life cycle is same. It will go through the same similar life cycle. And then the another source is the uh, within the LinkedIn services or employee itself, right? So whatever services they are like massaging the data, curating the data. Again, this is like another source of the data which has to be ingested into the uh, all the relevant system. Let's go to the next slide. So if we talk about the uh, scale, uh, this with respect to the offline uh, data scale. Currently, LinkedIn uh, is having the 950 million active members. And then uh, we have the exabyte scale uh, data lake already. And then if we talk about the uh, messages, uh, you know, in a per day, it's a trillions of messages, which is uh, in motion every day. And if I talk about specific to the offline part of it, we have more than 10 Hadoop clusters, uh, of course, federated and across data centers. Uh, and uh, there are like more than 10,000 Kafka topics. If I, uh, if I need to, if I uh, say about the Kafka, it's like more than 10,000 topics are ingested every day, which is the, uh, like the several petabytes uh, every day, which is getting uh, ingested into the Hadoop data lake. So this is the scale at which currently we are operating. And now, uh, so I have added a line here say, saying, you know, data ingestion when we talk. So uh, it's like having the right data uh, at right time and right place. So th th this is the key. I mean, so uh, right data meaning, so uh, the, the data which is required by your use case and uh, there has to be like the, the data quality if you heard of. So that is the, uh, the most important aspect of it, uh, the, having the right data and the right time. So uh, we cannot say, okay, uh, the use case which needs the near real time processing and okay, you go and uh, get the data from offline data like with the, where the latency is a couple of hours or a day. So that's not acceptable. So having the right data at right time and the right place. So of course, if we, it has to be in the online store, near line store or offline store. So that's the key. So if we talk about the use cases like the abuse prevention, I mean, uh, just one of the use case. So let's say some post which is uh, related to the abuse activity or something on the LinkedIn.com. So that has to be immediately detected and turned down, right? So we cannot have these use cases to work uh, on the offline data lake wherein the data ingestion latency is more. So similarly, if there are other use cases like the uh, people you may know the recommendation, the jobs recommendations, the, the search indexes, economic graphs. So they all have the different needs for the uh, data ingestion latency and the uh, kind of data which is required. Uh, I think sources of data we already discussed, I will cover in the next slide. Okay. So uh, in the first picture, we have seen uh, the data flowing from the uh, member from our online uh, stores uh, to the offline data lake. So how does it happen? So again, uh, taking the same example, uh, so member has done some uh, activity and we have the uh, data centers across different geolocation. So Brooklyn is uh, one such system which is acting as a streaming gateway for us. So uh, assume for an example, we have the uh, three data center in a different location. So uh, one choice is like we can go and uh, ingest the data from every data center and you know uh, ingest it into the data lake. Uh, so that that's like uh, one way. Another way is like uh, having a Brooklyn like a system, which is the uh, distributed and the scalable system. What it will do is it will actually act as a streaming gateway instead of uh, 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 I mean, the, the platforms directly uh, understanding the different data centers going into that complexity, it can get the uh, uh, data stream from the multiple data stores in a unified stream way. So the solutions which we have in LinkedIn, we refer as a Brooklyn mirror maker. You would have heard of the Kafka mirror maker as the uh, another uh, solution. So it's a similar to Kafka mirror maker. The change here is, uh, 
for the kafka uh, mirror maker if you have the one kafka cluster you need to have another kafka cluster to mirror the data so that's like a one to one mapping now if you have assume you have like a 20 to 40 kafka cluster so then that means across different data centers you need to have that many kafka clusters to really mirror the data across data center and that will not be scalable so brooklyn does solve that problem so brooklyn is like a single cluster and it can mirror the data from different uh, data center so it is uh, it is acting as a gateway for that another example for the cdc uh, record so let's say as a member linkedin member i go and change my uh, email id in the profile so that's like that will go and set into uh, our uh, espresso data store yeah so that's a document data store now uh, the data is available in that espresso it will generate a change log so what brooklyn will do is it will go and scrub the change log and then it will generate a change stream out of that so whether it's espresso whether it's a mysql oracle or xyz so brooklyn act as a gateway to provide a unified cdc stream for all the con uh, for all the consumers yeah so these consumers can be a, uh, a near real time processing like building a search index out of that which has to be quick or it can be offline data lake which has to ingest the data into the data lake yeah uh and if we look at the uh, from the architecture point of view the brooklyn uh, it it has the pluggable source interfaces and the destination so it can uh, get the data from multiple sources and put uh, push the data to multiple destination uh, what brooklyn today is not doing is it doesn't do any sort of a transformation in between it is just a, the proxy it will it can get the data and it can just uh, provide a stream so underlying it is using uh, zookeeper for the coordination and the task assignment let's get into the goblin so yeah so our again the same first picture where in uh, data now data uh, for the use cases where member activity and the member change brooklyn coming into the picture and then producing a cdc stream now this cdc stream or the uh, the event stream we need to be ingesting into the uh, offline data lake so uh, we use goblin as an underlying apache goblin as in a platform and if we uh, look at this picture the architecture point of view the constructs which goblin is providing uh, so go the goblin is a data integration platform so the construct like if you see the in the picture the source so it is like a pluggable source uh, wherein uh, it can be like a kafka source it can be a file source it can be http source or it can be a db source or anything of that sort Uh, the re the relevance of source is the source has to source sits in the driver side and it has to def do the planning for the uh, ingestion so when i say planning assume it's in a kafka topic and we have a multiple partition the source will decide how to uh, ingest this particular kafka topic so one simple strategy is like every partition can be ingested separately and then every partition can be a work unit so in the goblin terminology this uh, particular thing is referred as a work unit and now every work unit is assumed as in a task which can run concurrently in a different container yeah and if you look at the task the task will actually do the real uh, you know extraction of data then doing the transformation so uh, you can do the schema evaluations you can uh, a uh, do a, a sort of a filtering or you can do the data type change or any sort of a transformation you want to do that constructs uh, will be provided by the convert interface then the most important one more part is the quality interface i mean the quality uh, construct so that means before you write the data into uh, your data lake or any uh, destination uh, this will enable uh, to do a sanity check sort of a thing because you are not supposed to i mean we are not supposed to ingest the corrupted data which is not uh, ready for consumption or which cannot be consumed by the uh, the consumer right so the quality hook will enable that and the writers of course there can be multiple writers which can work in the sync and async way so uh, in goblin uh, what happens is goblin has the two mode uh, one is the batch mode and we will talk about the streaming mode so in the batch mode these containers are allocated as in a mapper we all familiar with the map reduce model so goblin internally takes a mapper as in a container and it will be, it will pack one or more uh, task into a container and it will run it concurrently finally at the end when all the task are done finally the data will be published and it is ready for the consumption so we use this model for the batch ingestion where the latency of several hours or a day is acceptable
Okay, of course. So not for all use cases uh, that works and we need a streaming ingestion. So we evolved the Goblin itself uh, to do the streaming ingestion and we refer that solution as a fast ingest platform in our uh, LinkedIn world. So what it does is like in, uh, the earlier model, it was the uh, bounded uh, stream. Like uh, if I take an example of Kafka, you have to process from this offset to this offset. And then that particular job is having a fixed work to be done. And it's a scheduled job versus in this model, it's like a long running container. So we, uh, this is developed uh, on YAN and there is a custom yarn application where the application master will allocate the uh, will request the number of containers to start with let's say 100 or 1000 and then uh, the internal construct still remains same uh, it is, will goblin uh, like uh, the driver part of it which we were talking the work unit will be created in the am side and then it will be allocated to the container what we do is we use apache helix here as, for the coordination so apache helix is the Again, uh, underlying uses Zookeeper and then it uh, forms a cluster for the coordination. So all the workers, which I'm talking here, they join as a Helix participant and then there is a Helix controller. So uh, Helix controller, which is in the uh, app, uh, uh, app master. Yeah. So, but with this model, what, what has it changed is like, these are like a long running container and instead of a bounded stream, it has become an unbounded stream. So now when we create a work unit, we are saying you just need to ingest this particular partition and it will be a long running container. So it will keep ingesting and then every five minutes there will be a new ORC file. I mean, we use ORC as a file format. New ORC file will be uh, produced in the uh, data lake. So uh, with this model, we were able to achieve the five minute ingestion latency. And one part of it is like we have uh, decouple the ingestion to the metadata registration. So assume like uh, you have uh, 10 thousands of topics and the uh, uh, that many containers uh, doing the hive registration or if or the Apache iceberg snapshot generation, right? So it will be millions of snapshots generated in very quick, uh, short span of time. And even for if we talk about the hive meta store as a catalog, it will be too many operations to handle. So to take care of that, we have uh, ingestion and metadata registration is a two separate pipeline. Again, metadata registration is like a streaming pipeline, which will micro batch teach every change for the five minute. And finally, it will do the re uh, registration in the uh, as an iceberg or as a high table. And uh, for fast ingest, it is auto scalable solution. So we have the replanner module, which will uh, continuously see if there is a new topic which has to be ingested or existing topic which are repartitioned. Or if there is a bursty uh, topic, which is creating a lot of load on the container, so then th that particular thing has to be replanned. So uh, the replanner module will take care of that. I'll go quickly. Yeah. So what we spoke so far is uh, the uh, member activity related data ingestion. So these are like a log data ingestion. Uh, there is no change which we have talked. The other category is the change data uh, capture. So. Uh, as, the, as an example, like you are going to a profile and updating your email ID and that data now Brooklyn has provided that CDC stream. So now the next problem is how do you apply this change quickly on your data lake? So how do uh, we use HDFS and it's uh, immutable. So we need to have a mutation sort of a, a capability in the data lake. So the famous, uh, the, the ways are like copy on write or merge on read. So uh, the way is like uh, you just rewrite your complete database snapshot so you can identify, I mean, either you completely rewrite, identify the files to be changed and do the rewrite. Uh, but the problem is the lot of IO and the uh, your snapshots are the petabytes of the snapshots, even a small change, you need to do a lot of IO. So that that's not that was not scalable. Another model is the merge on read, wherein uh, during the read, you will actually identify which record is latest and that will be uh, will be the uh, served as an output. But then merge on read will demand for effective, uh, to have the effective merge on read, the data has to be in sorted order. And that's where uh, it again adds uh, one more complexity, the data, uh, the sorting part of it. So now uh, the Opal, Opal is the solution which we have uh, implemented and uh, uh, underlying pipelines are based on the Goblin. Uh, but the, the main difference here is the Opal is not MR, not COW, uh, it is read time filtering. So uh, what does it do is, uh, okay. So the Opal during ingestion, what it will do is it will compute the validity metadata. 
So that means for every record, it will identify whether this record has to be visible or it should not be visible. And this information is captured as a bit set. So during the read, let's say I'm reading from this Spark or Trino, it will be just an O of one operation to figure out whether this record is visible or not. And all these change are captured as then a timestamp. So that means I can go back in history and I can find out this record was visible or valid from which time to which time. So that's the core idea of Opal. Uh, I'll go to the next slide. So, okay, so we have talked about the Goblin and Opal and the fast ingest pipeline, but as a user, what you need is like, I want my data, uh, which is present in the online data world. I want in this, this, this Hadoop cluster or in the offline data lake, or I want to be present in this, some external uh, uh, data lake, right? So uh, the, we have the concept of data movement as a service. What it will do is you just need to have a declarative uh, flow saying you want the uh, source A to be present in B, C, D, and then this will be internally translated into the DAG of physical jobs. And uh, it will provide for as a user, you need not deal with any of the complexity of the Goblin or uh, Opal or any of the those sort of uh, uh, platforms. Yeah. So primarily this service is used for the uh, cross data center data copy uh, and the uh, data backup for disaster recovery purpose. Okay. So we have talked about the, some of the use cases ingestion part, and there are several other pipelines which will make this data uh, accurate, the, the quality of data, the retention part of it, the compaction part of it. So as we discussed the change data capture, right? So uh, we are ingesting all the data, but then we have to make sure the old data gets deleted. When we are doing the streaming ingestion, we are generating a lot of small files and then small files will put the pressure on the name node and it will not be efficient when you are doing the query. So uh, we have the compaction job, the minor compaction, major compaction job, which will take care of merging the smaller files as well as clean up the cleaning up the old data. And then uh, there are chances like uh, uh, from the Kafka or from the Brooklyn or because of the pipeline failures, there are a lot of duplicate data which gets generated. So we have the data dedup pipelines, uh, which takes care of doing that. And of course we have the data compliance, data quality pipelines, uh, which is the proactively detecting. So let's say we ingested some data, uh, but then because of some issue, the data is corrupted or we are missing some data. So we have the uh, pipelines to proactively detect and transparently uh, uh, correct the data so that uh, it will not uh, interrupt the user business. Okay, so so one more change. So we talked about the, uh, we are using the today uh, Hive as in one of the table format and we have started uh, uh, like moving to the iceberg as in table format and open house is the our new uh, uh, abstraction which we are providing. So again, uh, so far we have discussed like the service, the data movement part the open house is providing the table abstraction API. So as a user, you always deal with the SQL. You no need to understand even whether it's a uh, Hive or whether it's a iceberg or whether it's a Opal or whether it's a Delta hoodie or anything. So this open house is providing that set of a uh, abstraction and it will take care of internally based on your query pattern, what should be the, uh, how the data has to be sorted, how the data has to be partitioned, the clustering, the access, all these things will be taken care by uh, open house internally. So we, uh, we are uh, moving towards the uh, managed table experience. Uh, that's one of the uh, uh, initiative which we are doing it. Uh, okay, so I'm running fast because sh short of a time. So uh, the future work. Uh, so uh, as, as we discussed, like we have 900, 950 million members and it's increasing and then the more data, the more uh, business. So the, the, the one more the biggest challenge is the scaling of our data ingestion pipelines today. So all the system which we taught Goblin, Brooklyn, uh, the fast ingest, the Opal, it has to scale as the data is growing and it has to meet the next three to five years uh, data growth. So for that, we are reevaluating the our platform and our tech. Uh, whether it can really scale. So just to give you an example, like the fast ingest, we are taking the number of containers in the yarn. And if the number of topics, like 10K topics we are ingesting and it becomes 50K. And if I, if I demand like a 50K containers or 100K containers the, in a single app, the, that, that's not feasible, right? So then I have to split that app into multiple streaming apps. And then again, that becomes a challenge on, you know, uh, different sort of a challenge. So 
we are uh, modernizing our tech stack and we are uh, exploring the flink uh, and multiple other open source as in the our new ingestion tech and then uh, we are also unifying all our format to the iceberg so we have the high we have opal and we have iceberg as well but we are trying to unify to one single table format and bringing all the goodness of opal or all other things to the iceberg and contributing back to the open source yeah uh, okay thank you any questions Sorry, uh, late. Yeah. Sorry. Um, can you give an example of what are you doing with the data that is ingested? Like uh, you mentioned three uh, scenarios where so one mm -hmm. was uh, I think online data ingestion, one was offline, and one was a I think five minute. Yeah. Data. So online data store is like the source of truth. So uh, you have your profile and that profile data uh, goes and sits into the online data store that will serve the live uh, uh, app and the LinkedIn.com. The offline part of it is used for the offline analytics, your ML, AI model training and all those purposes. And the near uh, near real time, which we talked about the streaming ingestion. So that's like uh, uh, if you need to do some processing in the uh, real time, like the abuse prevention example. So you need the, immediately you need to know what activity has happened. And based on that, you can take some action. So uh, and then uh, if we also talked about the search databases, graph databases. So they have the business, different use cases to be served in the LinkedIn.com. Yeah, I, I can connect with you offline if we can go in more detail. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I couldn't fully understand uh, Opal. Is uh, You said mm -hmm. uh, the records is visible or not. So is it using some sort of bloom filter to tell you, uh, you know, whether the record is there inside? Yeah, I think you got it right. So it's a bit set actually. So let's say you have 1000 records and it's a bit set. Every bit is actually uh, pointed to one record. So at runtime, when you're uh, reading the first record, but the bit will tell you uh, whether it's uh, visible or it's not visible for this particular time window. But what and this the bit set is generated of... during the ingestion time. Yeah. What's the definition of visible? Is, be, uh, oh, okay. Does it mean that uh, visible is the record which is the latest version of uh, that? Uh, yeah, uh, that's a good question and it's the latest version. So let's say you updated your email ID. So whoever is consuming the data, they should see only the latest email ID. But then someone is really want to go back in history and want to know at that particular time, what was the email ID? Then you need to do the time travel and uh, go to that particular specific snapshot or that particular timestamp. But then so, that way, every every record will have at least one version, right? So why bit yes. set? Every record has one version. And whenever the change happens, it will be a new version, which will be generated. And then only the previous record will be invisible and the new record will be visible. Yeah, so I'm unable to understand why bit set then. Um, uh, okay, so bit set is like the complexity. So with the bit set, it's like O of one operation. During the read, you can easily find whether the record is visible or not. Uh, okay. Compared to the other merge and read where you need the data in sorted order in multiple files and you need to combine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if you have more questions, we can yeah. catch up offline. Yeah. Any questions from the chat? Yeah, we have. Is, uh, one of them is how different is Brooklyn from Kafka Connect? How different is uh, Brooklyn from the? So Brooklyn, uh, I think, uh, as I mentioned, it is serving as a uh, stream gateway. Uh, I'm not sure of the Kafka Connect uh, in detail. So uh, maybe I can catch up offline for that particular answer. But then Brooklyn, the main use cases is the uh, mirror maker across data center and the chain data capture. So, yep. It... Okay, th there's one more uh, uh, from the chat. Uh, so how is data lineage tracked when data is ingested and transformed through Goblin? Uh, yep. and stored in iceberg and is there an integrated system to visualize this yeah i think very, very good question so uh, so we have the da uh, data hub as in the central data discovery platform and every data transform uh, every data flow which is happening from one system to another system uh, it generates a lineage event and it will generate what sort of a transformation is done. Like the column one, uh, A is transformed into A1, A2, or A plus B. 
so uh, every time we are doing a transformation from A to B, there is a lineage event which is the mandatory for every system to generate, and that lineage event is captured by the data hub, and it forms a, a lineage graph out of it, like the, how the data has traveled. And it is very much important for the data management and the data compliance uh, perspective. Yeah, so that's the core. Thank you, Bupi. That's all that we have time for. Uh, we are running out of time. Sorry, we, we need we'll to catch up. But yeah. please connect with Bupi. He'll be here uh, after the talks as well. And his LinkedIn profile is there, so you can find him there too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Bupi. Great talk. Yeah. All right, so moving on. So the next talk is. The next talk is from Cloudera about unlocking the power of Spark on Kubernetes. The speakers are, we have Amog, who's a software engineer too at Cloudera. He focuses on optimizing Spark and Airflow to run on Kubernetes. And due to his standout contributions, he's a committer for Airflow. Outside of work, he's quite passionate about sports and physical activity. Then we have Krishna, who's a senior software engineer at Cloudera. And he works on resource management and multi-tenancy at in Kubernetes. Even um, he has been working on a lot of different initiatives for Cloudera's Edge to AI data platform, and uh, he's been passionate about contributing to open source since his early college days. With the most recent contribution being to Apache Unicorn. Last but not the least, we have Satya Sundar Nayak. He's the engineering manager for the Cloudera data engineering team. He has uh, 18 years of industry experience. He's worked in fintech, big data analytics, and at uh, Cloudera, his team uh, runs the platform or provides a platform which uh, allows data scientists to run complex data pipelines using Airflow and Spark. He's also a fitness enthusiast and um, avid reader. So with that, I'll hand it over to the Cloudera team. Uh, yeah, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, so yeah, we'll be talking about uh, unlocking the power of uh, Spark on Kubernetes with Apache Unicorn. Uh, I'm Amok Desai and uh, he's my colleague uh, Krishna. Uh, so let's start. Uh, so yeah, uh, uh, since the evolution of uh, Spark on Kubernetes, uh, uh, there are a lot of features of Kubernetes which uh, Spark has been leveraging and uh, I will actually start in terms of uh, what do we have today versus uh, what do we uh, need. So uh, let's start. Uh, yeah, so in terms of the job orchestration, uh, uh, so Spark uh, very powerfully leverages uh, some Kubernetes features uh, such as uh, uh, the pod life cycles, uh, the, uh, uh, it uses multiple uh, hooks within Kubernetes and uh, successfully manages to dynamically scale and lot, lot many things in order to orchestrate jobs properly. Uh, coming to dependency management, uh, so you can package your uh, uh, applications and all its dependencies very uh, tightly together using uh, Docker files. Uh, yeah, in terms of auto scaling and uh, job distribution, uh, there are a lot of features of Kubernetes which uh, Spark is leveraging, uh, such as the uh, the pod templates, you can define your uh, custom resource definitions, uh, you can uh, use the dynamic uh, executor scaling uh, and etc. Uh, yeah, and also uh, in terms of the security and networking as well, uh, uh, Spark also leverages some uh, techniques of Kubernetes such as uh, the Kubernetes secrets, the uh, network policies, the uh, service accounts, etc. Uh, now in terms of what we don't have. Uh, so we do not have a very uh, powerful uh, uh, technique for advanced scheduling, such as uh, uh, there is no concept of uh, scheduling at the application level. We do not have uh, capability to do gang scheduling. We do not, uh, we cannot do preemption based, uh, based on the both priority and resource requests. And uh, we do not have great support for uh, multi-tenant platforms as well, uh, which is basically uh, uh, the cluster is being shared between uh, multiple uh, workloads. Uh, yeah, now uh, talking in terms of the uh, Kubernetes resource scheduler and why we uh, why we actually need something more. Uh, the vanilla version is not enough because of uh, these reasons. So uh, we do not have uh, uh, the queuing of workloads. Uh, 
So that means that uh, uh, due to some, some misconfiguration, if the workload uh, does not uh, go through, uh, it will be rejected straight up leading to the user. Uh, he has to go and implement a retry logic. Uh, then all the workloads uh, that are submitted are always to a single resource pool or queue. Uh, there is no sorting of applications, only uh, priority-based uh, preemption. Uh, there's no concept of treating the whole application as a, a gang uh, and uh, going in an all, all in or all none fashion. Then uh, it's the Kubernetes uh, scheduler was uh, inherently a, a service-based scheduler uh, for uh, basically uh, the stateful workloads. So it's not the most ideal for uh, stateless short-lived batch workloads. And yeah, there is no concept of applications, hence uh, uh, no application aware scheduling. And all we offer right now is cluster wide preemption. So uh, with uh, user control priorities and not at the workload level. <coughs> uh, so yeah, uh, now what does the solution look like? Uh, the solution actually comes in form of a, uh, another scheduler known as uh, Unicorn, uh, which is a lightweight uh, universal scheduler for uh, container orchestrator systems. Uh, yeah, the Y in Unicorn stands for YARN, K for Kubernetes, and UNI for Unified, and hence the name Unicorn. Uh, the latest version right now is 1.3.0. And one of the USP of uh, uh, Unicorn is that it introduces the concept of applications uh, for batch workloads, uh, which are organized in a hierarchical uh, queue-like structure. And it also adds uh, support for uh, multi-tenant platforms. Uh, uh, and uh, this makes it... Uh, available both on on-prem and cloud-based workloads. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. So uh, we saw what is missing in uh, the default Kubernetes scheduler. It was never really designed for patch workloads. It's, it's designed for services-based long-running uh, workloads. And we saw uh, that Unicorn, Apache Unicorn is a kind of a silver bullet in the world of scheduling in Kubernetes because, because it brings and kind of fills those gaps. So uh, what does Unicorn brings in terms of features, right? So the first thing we discussed was the uh, concept of queuing. So instead of treating the entire cluster as a single pool of uh, resources and everything goes into that single pool and borrows from that single pool of compute resources, uh, there is a concept of queues in Unicorn where you can define a hierarchical queue structure, which exactly replicates the structure of your organization. So it makes sense that if a cluster is being used by an organization and under that org, you have multiple queues such as maybe a sales queue, an engineering queue, a marketing queue. Under that, you might divide further in terms of regions, in terms of what type of compute nodes you want, and so on. And then you can tell what type of applications should run under what queues. It gets scheduled there. And those applications are bound within the quotas of that particular queue. So that gives you a lot of fine-grained control over uh, efficient use of the cluster resources. Then we have something called gang scheduling. Gang scheduling is probably the uh, uh, most important feature you need for deploying Spark on Kubernetes because Spark applications are uh, not individual pods which are running. And for Kubernetes, you know the uh, unit of the, the unit of computation is a pod. And so we need a context beyond pod, which is a collection of pod and application, which is a Spark application. And that is what Unicorn brings. So you can schedule your, your Spark applications in an all or none fashion, which means that Either the driver and uh, executors all come up or none do, which is what you want for efficient uh, uh, use of the cluster resources. Otherwise, you might have situations where you are in a deadlock, where some executors of one uh, Spark application are up, some executors of other Spark application is also up, and they are uh, waiting for each other to complete. You also have application sorting. So uh, instead of just uh, sorting pods, which is of no use in case of Spark, you have this concept of application sorting. And you can do different kinds of sorting policies, like for example, FIFO, state aware. And, uh, and you also have, of course, fair scheduling, which comes from YAN as well. And what that gives you is uh, you can make sure that applications run in a certain order, resources are uh, borrowed in a certain order. And then, then that again results in more efficient use of cluster resources. And the uh, other feature, which we'll also see uh, some. Uh, a kind of a demo regarding this is preemption in Unicorn. This is one of the uh, latest features which was released with the last version. And what this brings is it allows you to specify guaranteed resources in these queues as well, uh, along with the max resource, which means that every queue can expect to have a certain amount of resources at all 
any point of time and it also means that when you preempt from a queue you can never completely drain a queue because the queues are always guaranteed a certain amount of resources and this is very important for spark because you might start preempting and you might preempt a spark driver for example which has done a lot of uh, work or you might end up preempting the application which has been running for the longest amount of time we don't want to do that so in this example you can see uh, and uh, i have given an example of uh, what a typical queue so sorry what a typical queue structure might look like in uh, unicorn and in this particular example you can see that under root there is a queue for system this is system critical resources so you don't want this to be preempted by anything else and then there's a org queue or a rather a subtree which is further divided into different uh, departments of the org and the beauty is that the way you define the queue structure in unicorn can be exactly a uh, analogous to the actual organization so when you share a cluster within the organization you kind of intuitively uh, understand what workloads are running where and where the quota is coming from and here you can see one of the important features of uh, uh, preemption which is preemption fencing is also depicted which is very important again for spark jobs especially in a production environment you'll see why so here you can see some of the uh, gray boxes around certain subtrees have been defined which are the preemption fences the concept the concept is that uh, you cannot fence you cannot preempt anything from within a fence into the outside world but you can preempt anything from the outside world into the fence basically what this means is there's a fence around uh, the sales org and the engineer org which means irrespective of how much resources these two uh, get hungry for they will never preempt anything from the system um, uh, system uh, queue which is system critical resources very similarly to that there's a test uh, queue around which there's a fence which again means that prod will uh, will be able to uh, preempt things inside the test queue but the reverse will not happen which we don't we don't want test environment to preempt outside uh, uh, preempt from prod okay so before we get into a little bit more about gang scheduling and preemption let's go over very quickly uh, the architecture for unicorn um, this is important because this will help us understand what exactly is different about unicorn and why it scales so uh, nicely with kubernetes so as you can see here uh, the components of unicorn there are four components there's a core a scheduler interface a shim and then there's a web ui to nicely uh, see what's happening inside uh, the important thing to note here is that the scheduler core which is the brain of the scheduler so this is where all the scheduling is happening this is where the placement of applications is going on and those decisions are made that is completely um, agnostic of the underlying host platform the con container orchestration platform which basically means that it scales really well with the increasing number of nodes because the scheduler core doesn't have to care about uh, uh reporting getting reported from all the nodes of the cluster getting heartbeats and so on that is all taken care by the shim and in case of kubernetes there's a kubernetes shim which has been implemented and the shim takes care of converting the pod templates into actual application context and reverse it takes care of reporting nodes what is available what is not and it also takes care of uh, other scheduling uh, properties that kubernetes has inbuilt which is things like tames and tolerations right those things need not be uh, worried about by unicorn and then there's a web ui which is an interactive uh, web application which you can use to see all the queue structures we'll see an example of that as well um right now there are two modes to deploy unicorn the first is a uh, standard mode which basically means you replace the entire default scheduler in kubernetes with unicorn and very recently kubernetes has introduced the scheduling api framework so now you can instead of uh, replacing the scheduler you can implement different parts of the scheduling cycle as plugins so the new plugin mode does exactly exactly that which kind of is a lot better because an already lightweight scheduler becomes even much lighter uh so okay let's talk about gang scheduling which is the first feature that really helped uh, us unlock the uh, uh power of spark on kubernetes so uh, every spark application as you know is a driver and a bunch of executors and uh, it makes sense for uh, the driver and executor to uh, have resources so that all of them can come up uh, they don't have to come up at at the same time because the driver comes up first that's some init work and then the executors come up but if the driver completes all the init jobs and then they, there's no space for executor that's a uh, bad use of resources in the cluster so unicorn provides this functionality to define task groups and these task groups uh, are basically 
uh, these task groups together form a gang. And the way it works is uh, as soon as you submit the driver, Unicorn already knows uh, what task groups are defined for drivers and executors and how what is the min number of executors. And it can uh, try to schedule that exact configuration, exact template, but with help of placeholder pods, which are nothing but pause pods. And then once everything is available, it will simply swap with the actual containers. And uh, this, avo this avoids segmentation and deadlock, of course, but there's a much uh, nicer uh, result of this, which you really see the power of in public cloud, which is auto scaling. So in public cloud, as you know, uh, the auto trust auto scaler as, as and when new nodes are required, it will bring up new nodes. The problem is that sometimes when you bring up the driver pod and uh, the driver pod might start and require an upscaling, or maybe the driver doesn't require, but the first two executors require an upscaling. And then after that, when more executors come up, it might require another upscaling. So between the driver in it and the first executor coming, there might be two upscaling events. With gang scheduling, the benefit is that at this at the beginning itself, all the nodes are already pre-warmed and upscaled because the placeholder pods have the exact configuration as the actual template of the driver, which means that there's only one upscaling event which makes the entire uh, execution of the job faster. So this is an example of uh, Spark pod. As you can see, uh, to run Unicorn, you simply deploy a Helm chart. And once you do that, there's no other configuration or code change required to ex ex existing Spark applications. Uh, there's nothing you need to set as a configuration in Kubernetes. All you need to do, it's a very pluggable model. You need to add annotations, which are picked up by the Unicorn admission controller. And the pods, are ex uh, the pods start to get scheduled by Unicorn. In this case, you can see that there are some annotations which have been put, which define the task groups. So the right side, uh, that's on the driver pod. And the driver pod has defined the task group for the Spark driver and the Spark executor. And uh, there's a task group name. And that exact task group name is defined in the executor pod as well. Uh, this basically tells Unicorn that this particular Spark application, because now this has an application context, not just pods. So the bunch of the collect collection of pods is now one application. And now this has to be scheduled as a gang. And uh, what that means is now it will wait for uh, the resources to be available until everything can come up or nothing will come up. And there are, of, of course, modes of scheduling, which means that it's not always this type of a hard gang scheduling. You can also opt for soft gang scheduling, um, which means that you can fall back uh, to normal scheduling, uh, which comes in Unicorn. Okay, uh, so that is one powerful feature of Unicorn, which is gang scheduling. But the other one which we talked about was uh, a preemption based on resource requests, right? So uh, before that, uh, we can also see uh, what is the problem with uh, the vanilla Kubernetes scheduler. So I have defined a resource quota here. And you can see that the Kubernetes resource quota, once I submit the pod and the resource quota is full, in the second screenshot here, you can see that the uh, second pod simply gets rejected outright. This is not the issue with Unicorn, uh, which we'll see. Uh, this is how you define queues. So the uh, queue structure, which I had shown, shown you earlier, you can simply define it in a config map, uh, which uh, simply is read by Unicorn. And as you can see, the uh, config map and the queue structure is very self-explanatory. It's a recursive structure, which means that uh, whatever is the uh, uh, queue structure for the organization, you can put it in the config map and this automatically uh, becomes the context for Unicorn. Uh, this is the Unicorn UI. So the queue structure you just uh, just saw in the previous uh, slide, this is how it looks like. So you can see that the root has been expanded into org in system and then further expanded. In the end, there's root.org.engineering.prod and test as well. And you can see all the uh, values, which, which properties which have been set for the uh, last queue. Okay, so uh, this is one of the example which I was talking about for... Uh, uh, sh scheduling uh, with preemption. So here you can see uh, in the first uh, command, I have scheduled four pods. These are all uh, system pods for me. So these are in the system queue. And as I said, there's no uh, separate code change or anything required to define what queue something should go in. It's all using pod annotations and names annotations. And because Unicorn comes with an admission controller, uh, you even don't have to do that. All you need to do is put uh, and enable Unicorn annotation or namespace and not automatically uh, pods uh, go on that. Now you can see that the system four pod did not come up, but it did not get rejected. It's in pending, which means it has been queued. And as soon as uh, system three got deleted, four automatically came up in the second screenshot. Um, 
this uh, this is a nice example which shows fenced preemption so you can see in the first example the three system pods are running and then i also submitted two uh, two pods from sales test and engineering test and then in the second screenshot as soon as i submitted the two prod pods uh, you can see a few things have happened and i'll explain one by one uh, the few important things which are to note here first is that prod ha uh, prod uh, sales prod has preempted from sales test and not engineering test the second thing to note here is that sales test 2 has been preempted not sales test 1 which means that the pod which has been running for the least amount of time got preempted first and uh, all the applications which we submitted in the uh, sales test prod and uh, sales test uh, 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 queues you can again see all of those in the unicorn ui as well uh, so yeah unicorn uh, right now is at version 130 and uh, last year in may it was uh, it became a top level apache project before that it was, it was incubating and it became a top level apache project right now uh, unicorn is being used uh, in public uh, clusters uh, which where unicorn is being used is uh, in apple cloudera uh, lyft uh, zillow visa alibaba has one of the largest clusters and then there are a lot of internal clusters which are running um, amazon emr on eks also recommends unicorn as the unicorn studio for running with uh, spark operator and spark summit and uh, I always, uh, when I talk about Unicorn, I always end with uh, this particular slide because uh, the Unicorn commu community is ever growing and we have contributors from all over the place and uh, there's never no such thing as too much contributors so, uh, and too much uh, engagement, right? So we definitely love when people use Unicorn and unlock the power of Spark themselves. Thank you. I'll be taking questions now. Yeah. So why would you want to, um, you know, introduce multi-tenancy into cloud uh, when you can literally uh, run a cluster for every job, optimize that and, uh, you know, uh, avoid multi-tenancy? I mean, uh, I agree there are use cases, of course, right? But then, uh, you know, do you see any advantages of uh, running, um, you know, the organization's workload on a single cluster, on a public cloud? Yes. So on public cloud, uh, th thanks for the question. Very, It's a great question. So on public cloud, the thing is with Kubernetes, you're not just paying for compute nodes, you're also paying for master nodes. So every time you spin up a cluster, your workloads are only running on compute nodes, but you are also running a bunch of infrastructure around it and paying for that as well. So it always is cost effective for people to run workloads on a single cluster. And especially in public cloud, it's not like the entire cluster has to be one particular configuration, right? You can have, uh, for example, on AWS, one cluster with one control plane can have compute node group, which is GPU, another compute node group, which is compute optimized, something which is disk optimized and so on. And so you pay less, uh, you do more compute, and at the same time, while doing all that, you have Unicorn, which is making sure that uh, everybody's only using what they're supposed to. Everybody is limited within quotas. And there's also another great feature in Unicorn, which is user and group quotas. So implementing quotas, not just based on queues, but users as well, which I did not talk about here. But uh, together, all of this really enables multi-tenancy, which is very important for Spark because Spark is not limited to just machine learning. It's also data engineering as well. And a bunch of other applications, big data applications, right? So it makes sense for... Uh, Orgs to share a cluster. Okay. One more question. So on, we'll connect uh, offline definitely. Uh, hi. So uh, my question was, I was curious about how do you implement uh, your like gang scheduling. So uh, I heard two things. There's one way to implement it through Kubernetes uh, scheduler plug plugins, right? Uh, and then uh, like. I remember like taint, like when I was started hearing about the talk, I realized like, okay, maybe I'll do it through taints or something. So how does it work? Like what, what's the primary? Um, no, so taints and tolerations are uh, something that you control, something that you use to control whether something, a pod goes on a particular node or not, that is completely different. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry if I misspoke or miscommunicated, but what I meant is, so the, I mean, uh, it might be, this is not the right scope for going in implementation details, but the way gang scheduling will work will, uh, once you submit the pod, there are a few steps. The first step is reservation, which we talked about where the placeholder pods are uh, brought up and we wait for the placeholder pods. The second step is once that is allocated, the second step is swapping. 
where you start swapping containers. So the placeholder pods, you start swapping containers and uh, you start turning the actual containers. And the third step is uh, third step is garbage collection. So, so my question was like, I wanted to understand if you're leveraging anything in the Kubernetes scheduling world or Kubernetes like uh, standard uh, stuff. That so the is. scheduling cycle, which is being used is Kubernetes scheduling cycle. But every step of the cycle is now a plugin after the frameworks API was introduced. So those plugins are implemented by Unicorn. Okay. So when Kubernetes wants to bind a pod, uh, okay, that is a bad example because binding the pod happens in Kubernetes itself. But let's say Kubernetes wants to decide what node to put it on, right? So that plugin we implement which means now our node sorting policies will be used. So we have different node sorting policies. For example, there's a node sorting policy called uh, bin packing. What that means is uh, for public cloud, you want to go on the node, which is being used the most, right? So that you don't end up auto scaling new nodes when not necessary. So that is called bin packing. So that is a node sorting policy for private cloud. You might want to use uh, fair, which means you want to distribute it fairly, right? Or you want to use FIFO, which means first and first out, right? So, those things will come from Unicorn. And then once it comes from Unicorn, it goes to the shim layer and the shim layer will again report it back to Kubernetes scheduling cycle and it will happen. We have a couple of questions on the web. We'll take one. Yeah, so one of the questions online is uh, with respect to gang scheduling, how can real-time monitoring and alerting mechanisms be integrated to quickly identify and address instances of resource underutilization? So I think essentially talking about elasticity preemption and stuff like that. Okay. So uh, Unicorn, as I said, it's a, it's a very pluggable uh, way of uh, doing scheduling Kubernetes, which means that an end user should not even feel like something different is happening. And that is exactly the, the way you do monitoring here. So when you have a scheduling error in the default scheduler, you can just look at the pod events, see what has happened. Exactly same with Unicorn. Unicorn reports everything in the pod events. So you describe the pod, you can see why the scheduling has not happened or if it has happened on what node has happened, it's exactly the same as the default scheduler. It's just that the scheduling is advanced because the plugins have been implemented, but the reporting is the same. And uh, in Unicorn, we also have application history server. So you can look the different transition states your application went through. And when I say application, I mean Spark driver and executor. So the collection collection of ports, which is really key to Spark on Kubernetes and it's missing from uh, default Kubernetes. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, unfortunately, we are out of time, but I'm loving the engagement. Please connect with the speakers if you have follow-up questions. I know a couple of other people have also raised their hands. So please. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, everyone and everybody uh, online. Uh, you can connect with us here or maybe on uh, LinkedIn for people who are online, and I would love to answer more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so we have uh, two done, two more to go. The next talk is about um, operating Kafka and Uber scale. And before we get into it, I just wanted to take a minute and uh, see. So we did speak about uh, the ingestion at LinkedIn being in trillions of messages. Uh, do people want to take a guess in terms of what's the peak that we have seen at LinkedIn in terms of number of messages ingested in Kafka? It is in trillions, any guess? Per day, yeah. Sorry? 10. Uh, it's 32 trillion. And uh, if you want to visualize it, imagine a 500 rupee note. If you keep stacking them, it goes all the way from here to moon nine times. That's what 32 trillion looks like. It's so the, the scale sometimes can be huge and humongous. Sometimes we are immune to the numbers because we hear them so frequently, but um, it is indeed um, a great work to build systems that can operate at this scale. So with that, uh, I'll be introducing uh, Nikin and Abhijit uh, who are from Uber here to talk about how they operate Kafka at Uber scale. Nikin has been uh, mainly responsible for reimagining and delivering Kafka at Uber and he's made significant contributions in the Flipkart um, data platform before he joined Uber. Outside of work, he spends time building electronics, mobile apps, and aquascaping. Abhijit joins us um, from Uber too. He's a staff engineer where he's made uh, multiple contributions to Kafka's tiered storage feature. And before Uber, he developed a high scale cross region replication platform. Over to you guys. Uh, 
uh hello everyone my name is avijit i am a software engineer in the kafka team at uber uh, i also have my colleague nikin with me today will be uh, sharing our first hand experience uh, with operating kafka at uber so so we have one of the largest deployments of kafka in the industry uh, we have like a we have over thousands of broker Uh, which serve trillions of messages per day and several petabytes of data per day. Kafka is uh, the key cornerstone of the entire Uber tech stack, uh, powering several critical use cases. Uh, it is a foundation of both uh, batch and real time uh, systems. Um, some of the use cases, um, major use cases, include the pub sub use cases. uh with real time events um it also enables our streaming analytics platform which is uh, powered by flink and uh, pino it also enables our observability platform uh kafka also ingest a lot of uh, cdc logs from our uh transactional stores um in the end the batch pipeline uh ingests a variety of data into our uh, big data lake which is powered by hadoop okay so let's cover some basics first uh, so what is kafka kafka is a distributed fault tolerant um, real time data streaming platform it runs on a cluster of uh, one or more brokers so uh, producers can publish key value messages into kafka and consumers can uh, read those messages uh, from kafka um so the key value messages are stored into uh, user defined topics um a topic can be pa uh, partitioned into multiple partitions um each partition can have multiple replicas for redundancy um one replica of the partition is the leader which will serve read and write traffic and the other replicas serve as followers uh, they keep replicating data from the leader um if the leader goes down one of the followers can become the leader um yeah, and 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 it can serve it can keep uh, serving read and write traffic okay so uh, today i'll be talking about one of uh, one major aspect about operating or managing kafka deployments uh it is about upgrading the hardware of your kafka cluster so recently we were tasked with upgrading the hardware um with a high performance hardware the existing hardware which we had uh, had deteriorated it was uh, they we had we were facing multiple uh disk failures uh it was causing the server to go down uh when a server goes down we have to uh, replace with with a new uh, new server and uh, how do we do it like we uh, we have to cop first copy the old data on the new broker and then we make it uh, as part of the cluster so this process is called offline rebuild um during the time the offline rebuild is happening um one broker is not part of the cluster so uh, there will be some topics topic partitions which will have one lesser replica uh, available right and uh, if there is one other host which goes down then basically uh, one more replica is down and it may the number of in sync replicas you require to publish to a topic partition those may fall below the configured minimum configured you need and then the producers cannot uh, produce any more right uh if you lose all replicas and then, then the partition becomes offline so both cases you will have data loss if there are multiple node failures so talk about the challenges we faced for this migration uh we had thousands of nodes across clusters to migrate um when you when we can uh when you so we can replace a host um an old host with a new host uh we bring down the node uh we do the same offline rebuild process the new host will come up uh and it will uh, become part of the cluster um this replacement takes about 8 hours to complete 
Um, so if you think there's a 150 node cluster, it would take about 50 days to uh, completely migrate the cluster, right? Uh, you cannot do multiple nodes at a time. Uh, if you do that, there's a risk that uh, you may face, uh, basically some replicas uh, will go down and you cannot produce uh, to the topics uh, anymore, right? One major challenge we faced was uh, the new uh, SKU we had, like it comes with only one third the disk size uh, compared to the, the old hardware. So you cannot just uh, blindly replace one host, one old host with a new host, right? So if, uh, say, suppose, uh, yeah, so basically, if you have to replace uh, the old host with an uh, with one uh, with one new host, like one is to one replacement, the disk used percentage must be less than twenty percent, um, because the disk is is one third uh, on replacement, the disk usage will triple and you will not be uh, having sufficient buffer for any uh, data growth. Um, one way to tackle this is you could reduce, reduce the total retention on the topics to one third, but then our customers will be affected. So this is not an option. The other way to do is uh, we could expand the cluster, make it three times the current size. And, but this will create operational challenges. Um, for example, if you have to uh, do any deployments, it will take uh, three times the time it takes currently. And um, so like if you have to do a, say a hot fix, it, it, like it kind of becomes impossible to quickly roll it out. And also if you have a large cluster, um, you have to, you have so many machines you need and it increases the cost for running Kafka, right? So what is the solution to uh, this problem? So, uh, um, so we, we leverage TS storage to tackle this problem. Uh, TS2 is, is a feature which was developed at Uber. Uh, what it allows you to do is keep only recent data on the local storage and move all the older data to a remote storage. It could be like SGFS. And um, so what this does is you can run your clusters uh, with brokers with smaller disks, right? So uh, what we did in this case was, uh, we reduced the local retention on the on our clusters to uh, roughly one third, which brought down the um, disk capacity to less than twenty percent, and uh, basically it unblocks one is to one replacement with the new host. Uh, since you have lesser data on the brokers, uh, you need to when uh, the offline rebuild also needs to copy much lesser data uh, uh, before it can join the cluster back. So a comparison here shows without TS storage, the replacement time was about eight hours uh, with TS storage um, and you reduce the local retention, uh, it takes only one and a half hours. So, so we can do replacements really quickly. So yeah, so Nick, uh, Nikin will take over and uh, talk us through the rest of the presentation. All right, uh, do you or does your organization use Kafka? Please raise your hands. All right, I can see most of the hands up. I just want to emphasize on the importance of Kafka and a little bit of physical activity here. Okay, uh, so as Abhijit mentioned uh, that uh, we, uh, we leveraged on the tier storage, which we built in house to decrease the uh, our local disk space. I mean, our uh, data in the local disk so that the replacement of old SKUs, the new SKUs was much, much faster. There are a few scenarios where even after the rolling out of uh, the tier storage, we couldn't uh, replace uh, the old SKUs with the new SKUs uh, because of high disk usage. So what did we do in such scenarios? Um, we resorted to something called rebalance. What is rebalance? Rebalance is nothing but a standard concept which I have been using in the Kafka world. Uh, typical use cases where um, 
when the cluster is contained dead and then you add few more new nodes to the cluster and then rebalance the partitions or reassign the partitions from the old nodes to the new nodes. So rebalance is nothing but it's a process of reassigning a partitions from a set of brokers to another set of brokers. So how does this rebalance happen? So first of all, the new replica comes up, the new follower comes up, and then it starts catching up the, the latest data from the leader. And then we add it to something called in-sync replicas. Then we just remove the old follower from the set of in-sync replicas. This is called uh, the rebalance and process of reassignment of the partitions. So how are we going to leverage this rebalance uh, in our upgrade of old SKUs to the new SKUs? So if you uh, see that, right, like we first identify the old SKUs, a uh, bunch of old SKUs that you want to migrate. And then we calculate the disk size and then we also bring in the new SKUs, empty, empty brokers. And then we try to reassign the old, all the partitions from the old brokers, the new ones. And once all the data is copied, we, the old brokers will be empty and then we decommission them. So let's uh, go through an illustration uh, uh, on how this happens. Right. Uh, getting back to the basics, Kafka is a messaging platform. We send messages to topics. Topics are further divided into partitions. These partitions are stored in hardware service, which we call brokers. These brokers have ID like one, two, and three, which are uh, depicted in this illustration. Since these brokers are hardware units, hardware service, they can go down anytime, right? So for a particular partition, we maintain copies like if you see the topic two and partition 15, right? We also have the same copy in the broker two. Uh, so these copies are called replicas. And then the set of replica for a partition, we call them as a replica set, right? So let's say, let's assume that uh, we have a cluster of 100 brokers, IDs from one to 100. First, we have chosen uh, brokers one, two, and three to replace. Okay, these are the old hardwares or old SKUs that we want to replace with the new SKUs. So uh, these are the replica sets of the partitions. If you see uh, the topic two and partition 15, right? So they have uh, three copies, one in the broker one, one in broker two, and one in the broker 88. 88 we are not concerned about, right? But we only have uh, one, two, and three at our hand, which we want to decommission. So we pick them and then we calculate uh, the requirement for the new SKUs uh, based on the different disk sizes, right? Uh, we can compute number of new nodes that we need to add, new brokers we have added here, and then we generate a plan, okay? For every node that we want to replace uh, from the partition, we add a new node in the replica set. For if you see that, now for that uh, SKU 1, uh, uh, for this old SKU broker ID 1, we have added 103, which is nothing but uh, the new broker. So this rebalance is not one-to-one -one mapping, uh, we have a lot of logic that goes around deciding which broker will host a new topic and partition. So with that, uh, we add these replicas. And then once all these new brokers right, start copying all the data and is up to uh, it catches up with the latest data, we add it into the set of in-sync replicas. And then we start the decommissioning of that uh, broker, which we call it as a shrinking phase. So now uh, we delete the partitions or we remove the partitions from the replica set. We remove the data from the old brokers and then the old brokers are free and we can just decommission them. So this is how uh, we could do the rebalance and do the migration or any hardware upgrades, uh, you know, in the cl uh, cl Kafka clusters at Uber scale. So we face a lot of challenges while doing this. So one thing is uh, there's a huge amount of local data in that clusters uh, that we have to move from old SKU to the new SKU, right? So this operation takes a lot of time. It typically takes uh, one day to actually do this process for 10 nodes. And then if you see, right, there are five replicas for a partition at this temporary phase, uh, which means it will increase the replication factor, replication rate, uh, and then it will degrade the cluster performance. So rebalance is a process, like an ongoing process that goes for hours and hours together, right? But if a node goes down in between in the cluster, we have to stop this process. And then we have to wait for the recovery action to take kick in. Once it the I mean, node recovers, only then we can resume the rebalance. So and uh, given that old SKUs can have higher rate of failures, right? So it will always pose hindrances for the rebalance to occur. So what do we do so that 
we can actually decrease uh, this time. Uh, we came up with the idea, right? So I'll get to, before getting to the idea, I'll just uh, give a basics. What's the tier storage? Tier storage is nothing but uh, this is a local disk. Okay, we just copy, start copying the data from the local disks to the remote disk like HDFS or S3, right? So uh, we have to understand what's a uh, couple of jargons here. Stay with me. Uh, there is something called ro local retention, wherein uh, the time at, until which we store the data in the local disk. And there's something called total retention, which is local plus remote, right? Let's say the, each square accounts for one hour worth of data. There are five squares. So five hours of data is in the local disk and then remaining four hours, right? Like, so total nine hours of data are there for this particular topic and partition. Now, when the reassignment happens, okay, the follower comes up, it tries to copy all the data from the leader, right? Like this five hours worth of data. And we'll also build the metadata for this four hours so that, you know, uh, data is requested for these four hours. It can fetch from the remote, right? So uh, this is the scenario, uh, what happens during the rebalance. Now what happens is that uh, there is a scope for improvement here. If you see these three segments, right, are already uploaded to the remote. And still, we are still copying it from the uh, leader for the new follower, right? So what we came up with is something called as a tiered offset strategy. Uh, this is also built in-house by Uber, wherein we don't copy uh, the segments, which is already copied to the remote. We only start copying the data, which is not yet copied to the remote. It's just in the local uh, local disk of the leader. So now we just need to copy the couple of segments that uh, isn't available in the remote. And then we build the entire metadata of the remote so that if at all it becomes a leader at any point in time, the new follower becomes a leader at any point in time and wants to serve data, it can serve from the remote. And all of the data, uh, information about all the data is there. So with this strategy, uh, we could reduce the data copy by 85%. And then the rebalance time also reduced proportionately. If you see without tier storage, it took something around uh, somewhere around 18 hours for this rebalance to take place. But with uh, enabling after enabling the tier storage and tiered offset strategy, we are able to finish around 1.5 hours. Okay, so uh, to conclude, uh, this is how we accomplished the SKU upgrade at Uber scale. First, we uh, came up with a tiered strategy, tiered storage, which uh, saved our 80% of times doing the SKU replacements, which is which was one-on-one -on -one replacement for uh, uh, for the nodes which we couldn't replace one-on-one. -on -one, we used a rebalance. And with the tiered offset strategy, we could save 85% of the time. And we also minimized the data copy by the same amount, 85%. And all these concepts were automated, uh, which eliminated manual intervention and uh, human errors. Uh, this automation also helped us you know, uh, keep on uh, doing this upgrade around the clock. And with this uh, the scheduled uh, migration, right? Uh, we could minimize from some uh, Know, from years of planning to some few months of execution. So that's all. Thank you, folks. Any questions? So you said uh, in, in your last but one slide, uh, you know, it is served from the remote. Yeah. this one right um, it's served from the remote what's the performance impact um, when when this follower is serving from the remote or is it it is just for the copy purpose uh, it's not serving the client so it's always uh, the leader that serves the car okay yeah so the it's follower when it becomes leader it will uh, basically copy it on uh, yeah so there are there will be three replicas right so it will be the uh, it will be the uh, the least on the priority to become the leader but if at all this becomes a leader, when will this become a leader when all the other replicas are you know uh, down, yeah. right? So that possibility itself uh, uh, is less. But even if it becomes a leader, still it can serve the data from remote, so that uh, we, we'll, I mean, there's no lo loss of data. But but in that case, you will see a performance hit, right? Because it is serving from remote. Yeah, a well, bit of latency might increase, but uh, this is not typically what you would see on a general scenario of doing this uh, SQ upgrades. Okay, okay. What would happen to the uh, incoming data? The, uh, the, so 
would that still be added by that to the meter? Yeah, actually, it is becoming a like, uh, what I meant by that is uh, like, there would be more uh, uh, data that will be coming. Mm -hmm. So, so the leader is still online, right? So it can keep uh, getting in the more new messages can still happening. So the read write uh, path is not affected at all with this. Um, okay. So oh, um, okay, my, let me uh, re reconstruct my question. Uh, so here we are. Uh, what we are doing here is uh, we are updating whatever the data that is there up up to the some point of time back to the remote. Uh, offset right now uh, we are copying all the data which is not updated to the remote to a new follower so now uh, while all this is happening there is more data which is always coming in so which is going to the leader so that means like uh, there is no cutoff here which is accounted for like uh, so yeah, the so followers right even in normal scenarios the leader will always keep on getting the new data and followers will keep on catching up right so yes. that is the same kafka protocol that will continue to happen yeah okay with or without rebalance or this uh, offset strategy, right? Even in this uh, regular reassignment, right, which is the existing one. So even when it is copying from the leader, even the entire local disk, right, even new seg uh, new messages will be added to the leader, right? That all will be accounted for. Okay. Any other questions? There was one question uh, from the chat. They wanted to know what's the peak number of messages that uh, Uber handles. The slide mentioned it in trillions. Uh, I don't know if you're at the liberty to reveal it. Uh, yeah, I think we're not sure. We have to check <laughs> if we can. <laughs> All right, sounds good. And uh, any plans to open source this? Yeah, this is planned for open source. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Right. The last talk is from um, the offline compute uh, infrastructure team at LinkedIn. The presenters will be Christian and Aditya. Christian is a staff engineer in the grid compute team. He has been leading the efforts to scale YARN and queue scheduling for the past couple of years. And he has about 10 years of uh, industry experience building reliable distributed systems. Aditya is also a staff engineer with seven years of experience in the LinkedIn data infrastructure ecosystem. He's worked in multiple areas that include data ingestion, compliance, observability, orchestration, um, scheduling, YARN, and many other areas. All right. So with that, um, over to the speakers. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Krishan. I'm a staff engineer at LinkedIn. So I'm going to talk about the compute infrastructure for offline jobs at LinkedIn. And this is primarily our infrastructure, which powers uh, all the Spark, MapReduce, Goblin jobs that Bhupendra talked about earlier, and uh, how we provide the, uh, a multi-channel shared cluster to run these jobs at LinkedIn. So our stack is YARN, and uh, I'll, to give a brief introduction on YARN. So YARN provides uh, capacity across thousands of nodes where uh, it, it manages uh, and it provides scheduling features in the concept of queues. A brief introduction on queues. Uh, queues is a way to divide the capa entire capacity based on different use cases or different teams. And its users are flexible to divide it in a hierarchical manner uh, based on how the structure is. And within a queue, user jobs are submitted to a queue. And within a queue, there are various scheduling features like priority-based scheduling, so that your high-priority jobs are scheduled first or uh, capacity-based scheduling, so the jobs where the queue is within a capacity are scheduled first. Elasticity, where if a particular queue is requires more capacity, another queue is a, a sibling queue is using less capacity. You can share capacity, and that way improve cluster utilization. There's preemption, which is are about where if you, uh, where when you share elastic capacity, but you require capacity back to another queue you can preempt and get that capacity back. So all of these features are provided in the construct of queues. And Jan uh, provides this in a component called Resource Manager. And uh, we, we have built uh, features to simplify these queues at LinkedIn, which means that users don't have to actually submit, provide their queue names uh, based on users uh, uh, organization, based on the org structure, uh, the queues are auto mapped uh, for the jobs. 
And uh, we have also implemented priority scheduling. We've provided visibility into priority scheduling so that users are more conscious of how their jobs are getting scheduled. Uh, and a key feature, which is elasticity in a multi-tenant cluster is also something that we have improvised. We've made it a lot more, uh, we've had a long-term memory to elasticity. We've added fairness. So uh, different queues get different form of elasticity. And this elasticity is basically something that you can see some queues rely heavily on elasticity and this helps them to provide, meet their SLAs. It helps a cluster to be completely utilized. And uh, all of these features are something that LinkedIn has contributed back to open source. And uh, so uh, the resource manager component is what implements all of this. Jobs are submitted to resource manager. Uh, across these nodes, uh, each node provides a node manager which interacts with resource manager. Now resource manager has the entire construct of uh, what are the jobs submitted to it? What capacity do these jobs require? Uh, what are the nodes available? What capacity do these nodes have? What containers or jobs are running already on these nodes? And then the resource manager smartly distributes the jobs uh, to these nodes. And the resource manager does a very, pretty good job at it, right? Uh, now, at LinkedIn though, uh, our scale is gigantic. We run one of the largest clusters in the industry. Uh, to give some numbers, uh, we, we, we have uh, our entire YARN fleet comprised of 35,000 nodes and is growing every year. Uh, and our Spark, MapReduce, Goblin jobs, uh, like, we have about half a million jobs per year, day. And each job requires like 100 to 500 containers. So there are about 100 million containers that we allocate per day. Uh, our data lake that we talked about, right? Uh, we have four exabyte storage. And all of this infrastructure uh, it powers everything that you see on LinkedIn, be the feed, your member data, your connections, uh, your job uh, recommendations, everything. And as you can imagine, like these, uh, uh, a single yarn cluster, we have optimized a single yarn cluster to, uh, to a certain degree where a single yarn cluster does effective scheduling when we are at a cluster size of about 10,000 nodes. But beyond that, we do see performance regression. And performance is critical because users rely on that as for their job SLAs. Uh, so a solution to that is add more clusters. But as we add clusters, we don't want to increase user operational overhead of cluster discovery, where does my queue run, right? So what we have built is we have built federation solution where we, have, we are adding logical clusters, we are adding clusters, but really providing users with one logical view. So users really don't know which cluster their job is. They don't really care. They just want their job to run. So our users, so we have implemented an in-house solution called Robin. And Robin is aware of each YARN cluster. Robin is aware of how much capacity a cluster has, what queues are running in what cluster, uh, and clients call Robin to with the job details, and Robin then determines which cluster this job can run in. Robin implements various federation policies, which, which I'll touch upon, but now the clients are abstracted from these clusters, and that simplifies both life of clients as well as our platform. And to speak about the federation policies, so uh, let's say uh, we split a queue across clusters, right? Like there's a queue, there are uh, two clusters. We split the queue based on the cluster size. And uh, now your scheduling is working within the scopes of a cluster. And given the how bad jobs work, right? Like Spark, where there's dynamic resource allocation, which uh, requires different capacity units at different points of time based on what stage the application is. Even uh, after we're doing intelligent job routing, your queue utilization across these clusters is very skewed. As you can see in an example where a queue is present in two clusters with very different utilization at different points of time. So you can see that the time periods when a queue is above its capacity it, in one cluster, but below its capacity in another cluster. And this causes ineffective scheduling. Users rely on priority scheduling. Users rely on capacity-based scheduling and users configure the jobs accordingly. And if you're not able to provide those primitives, it's going to hurt users. An alternate way is where we pin a certain queue to a cluster, or we map a queue to a single cluster. And that way our queue scheduling primitives are available within that cluster. And you're able to do effective queue scheduling, right? But the, uh, the contrary part to this is now, elasticity cannot work reliably. Because elasticity uh, really requires where one queue, if, if one queue is overutilized and another queue is underutilized, you're basically relying on each other's capacity. But if these queues are on different clusters, 
you cannot rely on elasticity. And that's what you see in the second graph, where we see periods where one cluster is at peak usage, but the other cluster is at, uh, 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 at a much lesser usage. And then these problems are very important at LinkedIn scale. They have a direct impact to cost per platform, and they have a direct impact to users who really require this capacity. And it, uh, wastage capacity is not good. So what we're moving towards is, we want to now provide the same SKU scheduling primitives as our infrastructure is growing. Our infrastructure is growing at a massive rate. And we're building a universal scheduler, which takes SKU scheduling outside the YARN cluster and provides the same SKU scheduling features that users require, that everyone requires, but really working outside the, removing queues from YARN and uh, doing queue scheduling outside the cluster. Now a local YARN cluster is responsible to manage uh, the nodes within its cluster and the containers running on those nodes. It has nothing to do with queues. And that works well from both scalability point of view as well as, uh, so we are moving our infrastructure, offline infrastructure to Kubernetes as part of standardizing LinkedIn's infrastructure. And Kubernetes has very different scalability characteristics and very different scheduling characteristics. Right? Uh, and now we're able to, and we are going to be in integrate a universal schedule with both YARN and Kubernetes which is going to provide the same scheduling features as well as solve for scale. So we can add clusters as our compute infrastructure grows and that cluster growth will not impede your scalability growth or your scheduling growth. And uh, this also helps us to migrate workloads from YARN to Kubernetes because users don't have to manage their capacity differently for YARN or differently for Kubernetes. Their capacity management is really in the single place and uh, uh, your queue scheduling primitives, uh, your cluster utilization, everything is being provided. This is the path forward. Uh, I'll hand it over to Aditya, who's going to talk more about Setu. Uh, Setu helps in this problem and solves a lot of other problems that Aditya will now talk about. Hello. Okay. Um, Setu is a Sanskrit word. Uh, it means a bridge, uh, and uh, on one side of the bridge, we have cluster managers. Uh, a cluster manager is something like YARN or Kubernetes uh, or anything else that may come tomorrow. And on the other side of the bridge, we have uh, uh, clients that wants to submit certain kind of jobs to these cluster managers. Um, what kind of jobs? So uh, jobs is a... Uh, Jobs may, uh, uh, people, uh, different clients may utilize different words for jobs. It can be called cluster apps as well in certain scenarios. Uh, these jobs can be like a Spark, Flink, et cetera. Legacy used to be MR and so on, but Situ doesn't support that. Uh, so basically this is a control plane that allows submission of jobs from various clients to cluster managers. Now, what is the need of such a plane? Um, imagine if you want to submit a Spark job, what do you need? One is um, you need a Spark job to YARN. What do you need is a Spark client that has all its dependencies and various configurations loaded. Then you need actual Hadoop clients and its configuration, which tells which Hadoop cluster and so on to submit the job to. Uh, it also requires um, access to various other services like name node, RM, uh, Hive Meta Store, and so on. So there are security restrictions. In order to interact with such services, you may require delegation tokens, and uh, these are either provided through in a Kerberos setup by Akita, or uh, you you can prefetch the tokens by some other mechanism and then interact. Uh, that becomes very difficult once number of clients starts increasing. So earlier at LinkedIn, we used to have only uh, nearly one type of way of submitting jobs, that is through workflow schedulers. Uh, a workflow scheduler is like Airflow or Flight or Azkaban. You people usually define a DAG and then they define a job within the DAG and they uh, submit the job. In this case. Uh, it is the scheduler's construct, like in Airflow, it is a Spark operator in a Skaman Spark job type. Uh, they handle the submission logic of these kind of jobs to the cluster managers. Uh, but 
our requirements of such clients increased from workflow schedulers. Uh, for example, we have multiple services. One of the service that um, Bhupendra talk, uh, talked about was open house. Open house also requires uh, dynamically submitting Spark jobs for various maintenance purposes to the uh, Hadoop ecosystem. We have certain things like notebooks. So we have Darwin at LinkedIn, which is uh, our um, uh, data and ML analytics platform. This is similar to the Jupyter notebook solution that is available outside. Uh, from here also, people write uncompiled code snippets and execute them against a remote Spark context, which is pre-created by the notebook when you start a session. Uh, so these are various clients. So these are not just workflow schedulers. We need a solution that can support all these clients. What happens when you increase the number of such clients? So one problem is that uh, um, you need to support multiple such versions. Uh, at LinkedIn, we support Spark 2.0 seven around 3.1, and then multiple patch versions of all of them. And you require all these different versions will have different clients may have and different configurations and all of your clients need to be aware of them. The second is that there are various uh, policies. For example, if you want to avoid uh, uh, job submission that says, uh, give me an executor or a driver memory of 800 GB, Certainly, you don't want to allow certain policies like this. You want to control what are the deprecated policies. You also want to control that, yes, a certain version is going to be deprecated, and hence, I need to stop the job submissions from those point of view. Uh, security, I think I already talked about. If you want Hadoop delegation tokens, that is only for Hadoop ecosystem. The moment you move to uh, KTS, you require different kind of... Uh, uh, security mechanisms and those tokens need to be made available in a different format. For example, like a uh, like a secret instead of passing the token file into YAN during application submission. Um, then uh, we need support for execution engines. For example, the Spark is not the only one. Uh, there are various new execution engines like Flink that is available. Um, and newer and newer execution engines will keep coming depending on the use case. The last and not the least is uh, extensible to other cluster managers. So from the get-go, we want a control plane that can support submission to YARN and KTS, but uh, newer cluster ma manager can also come and we want a pluggable solution for this. So what we have is uh, just a scale here. Uh, for just for Spark, there are more than 100,000 Spark apps submitted every day. Uh, they are close to greater than 150 per 10 second if, um, uh, in, a, in a window. Uh, because this is the scale that probably we need to, uh, we need the solution for. The growth is that every two years, the number of such applications are increasing. Um, I'm not fully sure if you can see all of these things, but I will cover them one by one. Uh, I've already talked about workflow schedulers like Askaban, Airflow Flight. These are the three which LinkedIn use in some way or form, mostly being Askaban and migrating towards Airflow. Uh, then we have Open House, which uh, Bhupendra talked about. Uh, we have Darwin, which is our solution for a notebook or interactive kind of experience. DBT is a SQL first uh, data transformation tool. Um, and all of these clients finally want to interact with cluster manager and submit jobs. So what we have is uh, Setu, which is the entry point for all of them. Um, it takes care of security and impersonation, uh, policy enforcement, app submission to uh, uh, app submission to cluster managers for different versions and different execution engines. Uh, it is a single place for managing and deploying all the dependencies, specifically platform dependencies. Um, we also require some kind of a ramping solution. Uh, I gave an example that you want to ramp X percentage of Spark jobs to 3.1.x and remaining to an another version. 
Uh, you want routing capability in the sense, let's say your YAN cluster has uh, three different subclusters, then dynamically you want to determine which one I want to route to and such capability is best suited uh, at this location. We also require something like a global dependency management because uh, uh, many of the dependencies in the form of jars, uh, for example, Guava jar or common slang jar, these are uh, used across nearly all uh, user logic. And uh, if you see most of the, th these kind of jars are reused and hence we need a, a solution that can do certain kind of bookkeeping, expiry retention, so on. And this becomes a good place because it is aware of what are all the dependencies and it is aware of ensuring that those dependencies are available to your application when it is being executed uh, to, uh, on the cluster manager. So now going back, uh, this is a, a very short architecture diagram. Uh, what we have is all the requests are, uh, Setu is a distributed stateless service. Uh, by stateless, I don't mean it doesn't have a state, it, it has a state outside of all the different instances of the service. Uh, it is uh, currently deployed as a Kubernetes application with multiple replicas. Uh, we have a ingress controller in the uh, current choice of our ingress controllers am ambassador, but there are various other ones available. Uh, these requests are, uh, the entry point is the ingress controller and routed to any of the uh, replicas or instances of Setu. Uh, and each one of them can be honored by any of the instance. For example, if my job submission happened to the, uh, goes to the first instance, then all the tracking lifecycle kill and those operations can be honored via another instances as well, uh, because the state is uh, outside of those servers. Uh, what we really do is, let's say there is a uh, say two server running in one of the pod on KTS, and it has uh, it wants to submit the job to Yan, then it spawns another child process which is just responsible for submitting the app on YAN and exits. It doesn't stay there to track and uh, for the entire life cycle of the application. It just exits and rest of the application tracking and life cycle management is done directly by the Setu server uh, sitting within the pod. And that is the reason that we can scale this to a level. If, if we keep on having the child processes alive for the entire duration, that's not a scalable solution. Um, so this is a very high level overview. Once the request is received, uh, we also interact with Robin, which is our routing solution uh, before submitting the job to the cluster of choice or the cluster manager of choice. Uh, okay, so what do we have in future? Uh, so this effort is required because uh, uh, at LinkedIn, we are trying to move away. Uh, we are <laughs> trying Kubernetes uh, Spark on KTS as well. And uh, currently most of our Spark jobs are submitted on YAN, but we are trying to move to KTS. Now imagine a client who has written a uh, job submission via Setu, which offers a uh, narrow waste um, REST APIs for job submission. Uh, they don't have to worry on which cluster manager the job is being submitted to. Everything to them is via the REST APIs that is exposed by Setu. And hence, this allows a transparent migration when we will be moving. It also takes care of different security aspects or any other aspect that I have talked about uh, seamlessly. Third is that uh, the job submission across different uh, execution engines shouldn't look that different. Like most of the things remains the same and the rest are the configuration parameters, whether it's Flink or Spark or something else. Uh, some of the things are common across all of them and uh, Setu API is consistent across these execution engines. Uh, so this becomes a critical piece in migration to KTS, uh, similar to uh, universal quota manager that Krishna has talked about. Um, that's all for today. Thank you. Any questions? Hi, Abhijit, right? Hello. Uh, Sorry, I couldn't get to where something like Levy server, Levy or driver will be there in the last. It is uh, right. 
So what happened is uh, uh, before Setu, uh, we have a Darwin team and that required an interactive session and uh, um, they used to have their own Libby server. The problem with that is uh, <laughs> they, we, we support 2.7 and 3.1 as the primary Spark versions. And we have multiple clusters, let, let's assume for the name cluster one, cluster two. They used to have four different Liva deployments on four different, by four different images. And uh, that is not the way we can scale. Probably it can scale up to a Darwin level, but can't. Second is that uh, uh, making Levy into a distributed service with multiple replicas uh, was not very straightforward. There were a lot of changes required. Third, its API is very tightly coupled with the uh, with the Spark. Uh, in fact, you will see that uh, it says executor course as one of the top level fields, right? Uh, so it's not directly possible to have a very consistent API across execution engines. So we evaluated that and uh, yes, of course, we took various inspirations. For example, now that we support a uh, execution of uncompiled code statements via Setu, and then pass it to remote Spark context, this is very similar to what Levi does, like just, just um, have interpreter sitting in the remote Spark context, interpret it and execute it there. Uh, that is very similar to that we do, but then we are able to scale at a level that LinkedIn requires. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, Just a second. So how will this take care of all the job level dependencies that we have? Like uh, we have a Setu running and also uh, every for every type of job that we are submitting, we will be spawning a, a child process, right? So all these dependencies should be uh, handled through Setu and also from the uh, child processes that we are uh, yeah. uh, spawning. So the, the child process that we are spawning is uh, for submission of application to the cluster it doesn't have the user dependencies. This child process only has the platform level dependencies. Uh, why child process based approach? Because uh, it really helps us to support multiple versions. Now imagine the, the clients and the dependencies required for supporting uh, different Hadoop versions or different Spark of Link versions are very different. If you try to do some class loader magic, it becomes very difficult to maintain. In fact, at some place we have tried that and it, it doesn't work. Uh, so what we have decided is we can spawn the child process within the same container with their dedicated class path. That's how it allows us to uh, support multiple dependencies and different clusters and uh, configurations. So all these uh, dependencies, like all the jars that are dependent or that are responsible for this uh, successful running of the job. So those are uh, picked from the Setu itself or? Yes. Like so Setu has the API, which allows defining dependencies in two primary, primary ways. One is IV coordinates. Um, it's not just you have to write all the coordinates by yourself. You can you can specify transitive and those kind of things. Uh, that's our classification. Uh, the second is you can provide a HDFS based location. This can be comma separated different ones or a star or wildcard based ones. What Setu does is ensures that these dependencies are available when the application is running. For example, if application is submitted to YARN, then providing a HDFS path is completely fine. Why? Because uh, YARN takes care of localization of these dependencies to the local container by its own. When it goes to KTS, then we need to do something else. And this is uh, where some of the effort on Spark on KTS from our side is happening. Uh, the solution is still underway, so I can't fully discuss. But uh, the general idea is that once the once the container starts, it will take care of uh, ensuring that the dependencies from HDFS is again available to the uh, proper file system. So, uh, and also you said that the job, the child process that is started, so that will be uh, that won't be responsible for the life cycle of the job. Yes. So, would say to be uh, tracking the status yes. of all those jobs. Correct. But would that wouldn't that become a single point of failure for different jobs? Uh, uh, so Setu itself is a distributed service. So we have multiple instances of, uh, like tens of instances of running of Setu. And even if one goes down, uh, the job life cycle tracking of, let's say job one, is not tied to one of the instance. It can be done by any of the instance. And even if one goes down, then the rest, another instance will take care of tracking its life cycle. Yeah, uh, you said uh, the state management is different, so. So yeah, there is one question online. So 
Uh, can you summarize the responsibilities for Robin and Setu? Uh, is it yes. that Robin just helps in routing the job to the right cluster manager while Setu handles a lot of other responsibilities? Uh, yes, so uh, Robin decides uh, that based on the resource requirements of a job, which cluster to select. Uh, while Setu takes care of uh, submission aspects, whether it's regarding the uh, very platform specific uh, knowledge uh, in order to submit to cluster manager or various security related things. So the job submission and lifecycle tracking and management is very different responsibility from deciding which cluster to choose. And that's why Setu is the control plane, which actually interacts with Robin to finally decide the route. Any other questions in the room? We have time for one more. Uh, you talked about the resource downloading part of things. Now you have something called a system level resources and you have a user level resources. So now how Seitu is able to get the credentials which is available, which is required to basically get data from let's say if ABFS or your system, because now the credential has to be available in the local machine when the YAN tries to download it, right? So how will that work out? Yeah. Uh... So when Gyan tries to download uh, uh, here by resources, you mean dependencies, right? Yeah, dependencies. Correct. Uh, what Situ does is uh, when whenever an application is submitted to Yarn, there is an executing user of that application. Um, Setu writes the currently the dependencies for a given user to that user's HDFS location. So at LinkedIn, each executing user has their own quota uh, on name node, and uh, we write in that user's uh, location. That's how it is able. No, only HDFS, or are you trying to support something called ABFS also as a source? So that, okay, these two credentials Sorry? are available. No, what I'm asking is, so now you have HDFS as one of the resources. Ah, uh, I see, yes. Also ABFS or ABFS2, you are trying to do that. Yeah. Currently, we only have HDFS and Artifactory is open for all, uh, so uh, it works for us. But I understand your question. Uh, I, I think uh, that is something we need to do when we will do such kind of integration. Uh, I, that's all I can answer. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Aditya. Thank, Thank you, Krishna. But, um, so before we wind up, uh, I would really like everybody to take a moment and uh, please share feedback. The main intention um, of these meetups is for us to gather together as a community and learn from each other. The feedback really helps us to figure out what works well and should continue versus what can be done differently. It, it takes hardly more than a minute. So I would really encourage everybody to do that, please. Uh, we had four great talks today. Thank you very much to all the speakers who took the time, as well as uh, a big shout out to everybody for making time to attend this meetup on a weekday. I know it's not easy. I would really like to also thank um, everybody at LinkedIn who worked behind the scenes to make sure that along with the planning and execution, everyone everything went smoothly. And um, again, speakers, um, like you took the time to not just come here, but also share some of the things that you are working on. And we really appreciate that. It's uh, great to share this with the community and everybody benefits from it. So thank you very much, everyone.